Hello everyone, I already read chapter four, but I felt it was important that I put this in the front of the book. This chapter mentions some things that are descriptive when it comes to crime. So I didn't read it, but I just wanted to get you give you a warning that it is part of this chapter. And I will give you a warning at the end and I will have a warning in the, the title. So just wanted to let you know. Welcome back, chapter four. There is never silence in a prison. My experimental wing is circular with 18 individual cells on the perimeter. The entrance still has old school see-through bars. In one, of the old, in one of the oddest moves, the stainless steel toilets and sink, yes, they are combined into one, are right by the bars. Our cells, unlike General Pop, each have a small private shower in the back corner. The guards have shut off valves if you take too long. There is a poured concrete bed with a mattress so thin it's almost transparent. Handles are built into the bed's corners for attaching four-point restraints. So far, that has not been necessary for me. There is also a poured concrete desk and a poured concrete stool. I have a television and a radio that only broadcasts religious or educational programming. A single narrow window slot is angled up so I can only teasily see the sky. I lay on said concrete bed and stare up at the ceiling. I know this ceiling intimately. I close my eyes and try to sort through the facts. I go, I go through the day again, that horrible day, and search for something I may have missed. I had taken Matthew out, first to the local playground by a duck pond, and then to the supermarket on Oak Street. Had I noticed anybody suspicious at either? I hadn't, of course, but I reached back now and combed my memory for new details. None are forthcoming. You think I would remember this day better, that every moment would still be vivid in my mind, but it all grows fuzzier day by day. I had sat on a playground bench next to a young mother with, a, with an aggressively progressive baby stroller. The young mother had a daughter Matthew's age. Has she told me her child's name? Probably, but I don't remember. She wore yoga clothing. What had we talked about? I don't remember. What exactly am I searching for here? <laughs> I don't know either. The owner of the hand, I guess, the adult man's hand holding Matthew's and Rachel's photograph. Had he been watching us at the playground? Had he followed us? I have no idea. I go through the rest of it. Coming home, putting Matthew to bed, grabbing a drink, flipping channels on the television. When had I fallen asleep? I don't know that either. I only remember waking up to the smell of blood. I remember heading down the hallway. The prison lights come on with a loud snap. I shot up in bed, my face coated with sweat. It is morning. My heart thumps in my chest. I swallowed down some breath, trying to calm myself. What I saw in those Marvel-themed pajamas, that awful mishap in bloody form, it was not Matthew. That was the key here. It was not my son. Was it? Doubt starts to warm its way into my brain. How could it not? But for now, I won't let the doubt in. There is nothing to gain from doubting. If I'm wrong, I will eventually find out, and then I'll be back to where I am now. Nothing venture, nothing gained. So for now, no doubts. Just questions about how this could possibly be. Perhaps, I surmise, the brutality had been to cover up the victims. Yes, good. Think of him as a victim, not Matthew. Identity. The victim was male, of course. He was Matthew's size, and general shape and skin tone, but they hadn't run a DNA, t DNA test or anything like that. Why not? Why would they? No one doubted the victim's identity, right? Right? My fellow inmates begin their daily ritual. We don't have roommates in our 12 feet by 7 feet cells but we can look in on almost every other inmate. This is supposed to be healthier than the older ones where there was no social interactions 
and too much isolation. I wish they hadn't bothered because the less interaction, the better. Earl Clemens, a serial rapist, starts his day by offering the rest of us a play-by-play -play of his morning constitutional. He includes sounds effects like cheering crowds and full sports casting, mimicking one voice for the straight play-by-play -play and another offering color commentary. Ricky Kroos, a serial killer who cut off his victim's thumbs with pruning shears, likes to begin his day with a song parody of sorts. He twists lyrics, taking old classics and giving them his own perverse spin. Right now, Ricky is repeatedly belting out, someone's in the kitchen getting Viagra and cracking up harder and harder as those around him shout for him to shut up. We get in line for breakfast. In the past, those of us housed in this wing had our meals delivered, which makes it sound like we use DoorDash or something. No more. One of our fellow inmates protested that forcing a man to eat by himself in his cell was unconstitutional. He sued. Inmates love lawsuits. In this case, however, the prison system happily exploited the opening. Serving prisoners in their cells was expensive and labor intensive. The small cafeteria has four tables, each with metal stools all bolted to the ground. I like to mender and wait until everyone else is seated so that I can find the stool that will put me as far away from the more animated of my fellow inmates as possible. Not that the conversations aren't stimulating. The other day, several inmates got into a heated one-upmanship over who had raped the oldest woman. Earl battered his opponents with his claim of, I don't want to say it, after he broke into her apartment via the fire escape. Other inmates questioned Earl's claim. They thought that he might be exaggerating just to impress them. But the next day, Earl came back with saved newspaper clippings. This morning, I get lucky. One table is totally open. After scooping up some powder eggs and bacon and toast, I'll skip the obvious comment about how awful prison food is. I take a stool in the farthest corner and begin to eat. For the first time in forever, I have an appetite. I realize that my mind has stopped going back to that night or even that photograph and has started to focus on something ridiculous and fa fantastical. How to escape from breaks. I have been here long enough to know the routines, the guards, the layouts, the schedule, the personnel, whatever. Conclusion, there is no way to escape, none. I had to think outside the box. A tray slamming down on the table startles me. A hand is stuck into my face for me to shake. I look up and into the man's face. People say that the eyes are the windows to the soul. If that's true, this man's eyes flash no vacancy. David Burroughs, am I right? His name I know is Ross Summers. He transferred in last week, waited on an appeal that would never happen but I'm surprised they let him out of his cell at all. Some, Sumner's case made headlines, the stuff of streaming service documentaries and true crime podcasts. He was super rich. He was a super rich prep. Do they still use that term? Who gone psychotically bad? Ross, who was handsome in a Ralph Lauren ad way, had murdered at least 17 people, men, women, children of all ages, and eating their intestinal tracts. Ooh. That was it. Just the intestinal tracts. Body parts were found in a top in a top of the line sub-zero freezer in the basement of his family estate. None of these facts are in dispute. Sumner's appeal is based on the jury's conclusion that he is saying. Ross Sumner still holds his hands out, his hand out and waits for me to take it. There is a smile on his face. I would rather French kiss a live rodent than shake the man's hand, but in prison, you do what you have to do. 
I reluctantly shake the hand as fast as possible. His hand is surprisingly small, dainty. As I pull mine back, I can't help it. I wonder what that hand has touched. Supposedly, supposedly, he slit his victim open while they were still alive and used his hands, including that hand, to rip open the slit and reach inside the ab abdomen and grab hold of the intestines. So much for having an appetite. Ross Sumner smiles as though he can read my thoughts. He is about 30 years old with jet black hair and delicate features. He takes the stool directly across from me. Lucky me. I'm Ross Sumner, he says. Yeah, I know. I hope you don't mind me sitting with you. I say nothing. It's just that the other men in here, Ross shakes his head. I find them rather coarse, unrefined, if you will. Do you know that you and I are the only college graduates? That so? I nod. I kept my eyes on my plate. You went to Amherst, am I right? He pronounced Amherst correctly, keeping the H silent. Fine school, he continues. I liked it better when they called themselves the Lord Jeffs. The Am Amherst Lord Jeff. Such a majestic name. But of course, the woke crowd didn't like that, did they? They have to hate on a man who died in the 18th century. Ridiculous, don't you think? I play with my powdered eggs. I mean, now they call themselves the Amherst Mammoths. Mammoths, please. That's so pathetically PC, don't you think? But here's something you'll enjoy knowing. I went to Williams College. The F. That makes us rivals. Funny, you no? Know? Sumner gives me a boyish grin. Yeah, I say, hilarious. Then he says, I hear you had a visitor yesterday. I go stiff. Ross Sumner sees it. Oh, don't look so surprised, David. He still wears the boyish grin. That grin had probably gotten him far. On a purely physical level, it was a nice grin. Charming. The kind that opened doors and lowers inhibitions. It was also probably the last sight his victims saw. It's a small prison. A man hears things. That is true. Rumor has it that Sumner's family is not afraid to use their money to influence his treatment. I believe those rumors. I try to make it a point to stay informed. Uh-huh, I say, keeping my eyes on the eggs. So how did it go? How did what go? Your visit. With your sister-in-law, was it? I say nothing. It must have been something right. Your first visitor after all this time. You seemed distracted before I came over. I look up. Look, Ross, I'm trying to eat here, okay? Ross throws up his hands in mock surrender. Oh, pardon me, David. I didn't mean to pry. I wanted us to be friends. I have been starving for any sort of in intellectual stimulation. I imagine you must feel the same. Both of us being graduates of the small eyes, I thought we would have a bond, a report, if you will. But I see now that I've caught you at a bad time. Please forgive me. It's fine, I muttered. I take another bite. I can feel Sumner eyes on me. Then he whispers, are you thinking about your son? The chill starts at the base of my skull and scurries down my spine. What? How did it feel, David? His eyes are ablaze. I'm talking on purely intellectual level. A proper discussion between educated men. I consider myself a student of the human condition. So I want to know. Be analytical or emotional. That's up to you. But when you lifted that baseball bat above your head and smashed it down on your own child's skull, what went through your mind? Was it a release? I mean, did you feel you had to do it? Or were you trying to quiet voices in your head? Or was the feeling more effort? Go fuck yourself, Ross. Sumner frowned. Go fuck myself? Seriously? That's the best you can come up with? Really, David, I'm disappointed. I came here for a serious philosophical discussion. We know things others don't. I want to understand what could possess a man to do something so barbaric. 
to kill his own son, the flesh of your own flesh. I mean, that might make me sound like a hypocrite, lunatic, I corrected. But you see, I kill strangers. Strangers are life props, don't you think? Stage dressing, deep background for our worlds, the inner world we create. We are all that matter in the end, don't you think? Think about it. We cry harder when a beloved pet dies than when a tsunami kills hundreds of thousands of humans. Do you see my point? I see no reason to open my mouth. That will just encourage him. Ross Sumner leans towards me. I killed strangers, props, scenery, window dressings. But to kill your own child, your own flesh and blood? He shakes his head as though mystified. I seethe, but stay quiet. What's the point? I don't need to win favor with this psychopath. I look for another seat, but it isn't as though another table companion would be less disturbing. Ross Sumner daintily unfolds his paper napkin and lays it on his lap. On his lap. He takes a tiny bite of the eggs and makes a face. This food is simply awful, he says, absolutely tasteless. <laughs> I can't help myself as opposed to, say, human intestines. Sumner stares at me for a moment. I stare back. You never show fear in here, not ever, not for a second. It is in part why I made the wise crack in the first place. Much as you might want to wallow in silence, you can never take shit in here because the shit will just grow exponentially. Ross Sumner keeps up the eye contact for another second or two before throwing his head back and bursting out in laughter. Everyone turns towards us. Now that, he exclaimed when he catches his breath, was funny. No, really, David, that was, that's what I was talking about. That's why I sat here for that kind of give and take, for that kind of mental stimulation. Thank you. Thank you, David. I don't reply. He is still laughing as he rises and says, I'm going to grab some toast. May I get you something while I'm up? I'm good. I close my eyes for a moment and rub my temples. A headache is crashing through me like a freight train. They started after the first beating the remnants of a concussion and cracked skull. The prison doctor called them cluster headaches. I am still massaging my temples, stupidly letting my guard down when an arm snakes around my neck. Before I can react, the arm snaps back hard, crushing my windpipe. My throat feels as though it's about to spurt out the back of my neck. My eyes bulge, my hands clawing and impotently at his forearm. Ross Sumner tightens his grips. He pulls back harder now. My, la my legs shoot up. My shins smack on the table. The utensils jump. I started falling backwards. Sumner releases his iron grip as the back of my head slams against the floor. I see stars. I blink. When I look up, Ross is leaping high in the air. That boyish grin is way north of man Manacle now. I try to roll away. I try to raise my hand to war him off, but I'm too late. Ross lands on me with a full with his full weight. Both knees pulverize in my rib cage. I see more stars now. I try to call out, try to scramble away, but Sumner straddles me. I wait for him to start throwing punches, wondering what I can do to stop him. But that's not what he does. Instead, he opens his mouth wide and lowers his head towards my chest. Even though my even through my prison jumpsuit, the bite breaks my skin. I howl. Ross sinks his teeth deeper into the fleshy area right below my nipple. The pain is, is excruciating. The other inmates quickly surround us and locks arms and fairly common prison technique to keep the guards away. But somewhere in the deep recess of my brain, I know that no guard will step in. Not yet anyway. Not until one of us is unconscious. It's safer for them. Guards don't like risk and injury. I am on my own. Still on my back, his teeth drawing blood. I draw on whatever reserves are left in my empty tank. I lift my hands up, 
palm facing each other, and with all my limited strength, I box Ross ears. The blow do not land flush, but Sumner jaw still unclenches. That's all I could have hoped for. I rolled hard trying to get him off me. He goes with my momentum. When his feet hit the ground, he pounces on my back. He threads his arm back around my windpipe. His grip tightens. I can't get air. I twist back and forth. Ross holds me. I try to buck and flail. Ross' grip does not slacken. Pressure is building in my head. My lungs are crying out for air. The stars are back, swirling. But what I mostly see now is night. I struggle for one breath, just one. But that's a no-go. I can't breathe. My eyes start to close. My fellow inmates' cheers are one instant indistinct blur. Ross lowers his head closer to me. That ear looks tasty. He is about he is about to bite down on my ear. I barely care. I try again to buck, but there is nothing behind it. All I can think about is being able to breathe. Just one breath. That's all. His lips are right up against my ear now. I struggle like a dying fish on the line. Where the hell are the guards? By now, they should be stepping in. They don't want a dead inmate. That's not good for anyone. But then I remember Ross' wealth. His family, his, his family proclivity for payoffs. And again, I realize that no one is going to save me. If I lose conscious, I'm about to, I die. And if I die, where would that leave Matthew? Seconds now from passing out, capillaries, capillaries, capillaries <laughs> burst in my closed eyes. I lowered, let me highlight that because I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I lower my chin and let myself go limp. This isn't easy. I go against every instinct, but I pull it off. There is only one thing left to do. Fight fire with fire. I open my mouth and bite down on Ross' arm, hard. His cry of pain is the most satisfying sound I have heard in a long time. The grip on my windpipe immediately eases as he tries to pull his arm away. I greedily gup air through flaring lips, but my teeth don't let go. His, he screams again. His jaw clenches down even stronger. He shakes his arm. I hang on like a bulldog. I feel the hairs of his arms against my face. I bite down even harder. His blood trickles into my mouth. I don't care. Ross had managed to stand. I am on my knees. He throws a punch. I think it hits the top of my head, but I don't feel it. He tries to gather enough, enough leverage to pull his arm free, but I'm ready. The crowd is on my side now. I throw an elbow at his groin. Ross Sumner collapses like a folding chair. His weight tears his arm free from my teeth, but some flesh stays behind. I spit it out. <laughs> <laughs> I jump on him, straddle his chest, and start throwing punches. I flatten his nose. I can actually feel the cartilage spread under my knuckles. I grab his collar and pull him up. Then I cock my fist again, take my time, and throw hard at his face. Splat! I do it again. Then again, Sumner head lows now as though his neck is a weak spring. I'm almost giddy now. My eyes are wide. I pull back again to hit him, but this time, someone hooks my arm. Then someone tackles me from behind. The guards are on me now, pinning me to the ground. I don't resist. I keep my eyes on the bloody mess of a man lying on the floor in front of me. And for a brief moment, I actually smile. Woo! That's the end of chapter four. Now, there was some parts in here that was kind of like, do I want to keep reading this because I, I don't want to read all of this type of stuff going through this book, but he is in prison and he is in for murder and his child. And he did already say who he's housed with, but do I need those details? No. So I'm just going to hope that the book 
if they bring up this gel stuff again, don't put that kind of detail in. But I'll read it. And in the this um in the title of the chapter, I will put warnings to let you know that it's kind of descriptive. I got disclaimer. No, I can't. I got to figure out which warning I need to use because some of the details I did not want to say. And um, yeah, so about this chapter. This was kind of like a buff chapter. Let's hope that there's not too many more of these kind of chapters because you know me. If you know, you know. I don't like a lot of detail. I need the action to keep going. Okay, so that's that. Um, there was one word, so please hold for the definition video. Okay, I'm back. The word is spelled C-A-P-I-L-L-A-R-I-E-S, and it is a noun. It's anonymy, autonomy, autonomy, any of the fine branching blood vessels that form a network between the uh, art, arterials and ven yeah, these are some words that I don't want. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce. R T E R I O L E S A R T E R I O L E S and V E N U L E S, and this is how it is pronounced. Capillary. Capillaries. Okay, so it's capillaries. All right, so let's go back to where it was in the book. Seconds now from passing out, capillaries bursting in my closed eyes. I lower my chin and let myself go limp. Okay, capillaries is the word. All right, so that's it for chapter four. I'm going to see you in chapter five. Bye.